Welcome to the Enemies Within the Church podcast. You can go to EWTCnews.com, that stands for Enemies Within the Church, EWTCnews.com to view the uh, documentary if you haven't already. You can also view the continued projects, which this podcast is part of. Uh, And I think you might notice something a little bit different about this week if you're watching in video. I'm not just having an interview, but it's in person. Through a lot of lucky coincidences, we, which I don't think is actually coincidence, but sure. <laughs> I'm actually able to be here in person with Jared Moore, which I'm going to let him talk a little bit about uh, his area of interest, the, his book that he recently released, and why why we're, we're doing this podcast. But I want to remind you, you can also go to the link in the description, the Patreon for this podcast, it's for the podcast and the website. If you want to support the work of that in particular, that goes to me so I can continue to do those things, continue to do the podcast and the work on the website while Enemies Within the Church is trying to gear up for a new documentary, larger projects. We need to direct the funds in that direction, but we also want to keep the podcast going. So if you want to support that, uh, go to the link in the description. I would really appreciate but it is not a necessary thing. Now, what are we talking about this week? So, Jared, we're going to talk about a few different things. But give me a little bit of a rundown. Where have me and you intersected recently? What's the topics that we've been having crossover on? Yeah, we've been talking about the Side B Gay Christian Movement, Preston Sprinkle, and... Um, We've seen some of those examples in the SBC, uh, PCA, um, but that's where we, we're looking at this upside down uh, Bible, study Bible, and um, you know, those are, that's pretty much where we've been. The doctrine of sin, uh, mm-hmm. hemartiology, uh, is what we're wrestling with. And basically, most of evangelicalism has left behind um, a biblical definition of sin. We've overemphasized grace and love of God to where we don't really understand grace and love because we don't understand sin and how heinous and wicked and evil we are apart from Christ. Yeah. Um, we don't understand the doctrine of sin. And so that's where my work's been is wrestling and wrestling with the text, dealing with what sin is and, and uh, helping folks to think rightly about sin. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's what I call a la carte theology. <clears throat> You're picking out individual doctrines without putting them in the context of everything else. Mm -hmm. No doctrine sits isolated from everything else. No, No doctrine is alone. They all interact with something else. So if you have an aberrant view of, well, if you watched who the, who is the Preston real Preston Sprinkle episode on hell, I talked a great deal about that, about how Preston's isolated, so isolated the doctrine of hell that he ignores all the inconsistencies that his view creates. But I think it's a huge, huge problem nowadays. Now, quickly, quickly, plug your book. Okay, you wrote a book. What is that book? What is it about? And, and why is it useful? Why is it it's something worth, worth reading? Yeah, so the, the book is The Lust of the Flesh, and it's thinking biblically about um, same-sex attraction and so-called sexual orientation, you know, and um, helping people think rightly about particularly the doctrine of sin, but as it relates to homosexual sin. And um, people in their hearts, there's this big movement in evangelical Christianity where they call, um, they, they use language like, I experience same-sex attraction. You see Sam Alberry say this. Um, you see Preston Sprinkle say this, Wesley Hill, Nate Collins, and you know I pointed this out yesterday at the men's conference, but you never talk that way about anything else in yeah. life. Like the Holy Spirit produces inclinations in us to love God, um, to be holy, all those things, and we never say I'm experiencing a love for God. Where I'm experiencing a desire to be obedient to God. No, we we just take responsibility for it and say, um, I love God. You yeah. know, I, and so the reason why people use language to distance themselves from their evil desires, 
is to say that it's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. I'm not mindfully involved in this, even though they're the ones who are literally desiring evil. Yeah. And their hearts literally are bent against God. And, and instead of taking responsibility for it and repenting of it, they're saying, no, I'm, I'm experiencing it. It's not my fault. And so they don't have to repent from it. So it's a, it's a way to get out of sin using rhetoric, which we know that rhetoric doesn't save anyone. No. Um, but so my book kind of rebuts those mentalities that rhetoric can save us. That if I just rearrange and reword, you know, sin, then I'm not responsible for it. It's excuses. And I want to expose those excuses so that people can actually get f- saved by Jesus and also be sanctified by him. Actually. Mm-hmm receive and freedom in Christ that's available to them if they'll just quit excusing literally evil in their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was something that was really impactful. So there was a little men's conference yesterday. Um, That's where Jared and I uh, were able to meet up. But that's something that I thought was really, really well done in your presentation yesterday it was not condemnation. Mm -hmm. It was hope. Mm -hmm. Now that hope was hope that comes through conviction. Mm -hmm. You have to be convicted of your sin to get to the freedom, to get to the hope, to get to the the good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I thought there was such a good balance of convicting people with the truth for the purpose of building them up, getting them to a higher place. Mm-hmm. And I know I know for me personally, this is one of the things that frustrates me about looking at Preston Sprinkle or looking at some of these other people um, that push these ideas about sin, push these ideas about homosexuality, push these ideas about, you know, whatever view it is, where is the hope? The hope suddenly becomes where you're at. Mm -hmm. And I got to be honest, even at this point in my life, I don't like where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be where I'm at. I don't want to stay still. I want to be pursuing God. Uh, I want to be, you know, at this point, I'm still just a small child stepping into daddy's shoes. Mm Mm-hmm. And knowing that I don't fit into them. Yeah, sure. I want to pursue that. I want to pursue growth until the point that I can walk in those shoes. Mm -hmm. Now, just because that doesn't happen this side of heaven doesn't mean that I want to just stay stagnant. I spent way too much of my life stagnant, and it was horrible. Yeah, yeah. Horrible. My man. So, uh, uh, Jared... Let's let's dive into this a little bit. So we're going to talk a tiny bit. I've already mentioned the Upside Down Kingdom Study Bible. This Bible that was recently released um, by Zondervan was edited by Preston Sprinkle. Whole list of contributors, which we'll cover that at a later time, just the expanded contributors. But let's talk about this Bible a tiny bit. So... <laughs> Yeah, there are, there are small children around, by the way. <laughs> they are a blessing from the Lord. Amen. Uh, but let's talk about this this Bible a little bit. Sure. So, me and you have, have sent some, some comments back and forth about this already behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And give me your overall impression, in particular, because this is something that, that was fascinating to me. I had a concept of what it was going to be. And then I actually got it in my hands, and it was something different. Mm. I'll, I'll just put it that way for a moment. So, so give me that. What is your impression of, of this, this, this Bible, and in particular, versus your initial expectations of it? Yeah, my initial expectations was that most of it would be right, except for the gender sexuality stuff. It was my initial impression. But once you get it and you read it, the entire hermeneutic, so the method for interpretation that they use to, to interpret Scripture 
is the the lens of critical theory. Mm-hmm. It's 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 literally this um, it's literally this mentality and framework that they have taken and they've placed it on the Bible and they interpret the scriptures not based on the scripture what the scripture demands but based on the framework that they have imposed on the Bible. Yeah. And so that's that's the issue. And yeah. um, the entire thing is like that, critical theory everywhere. Yeah. And from women, so think of women being oppressed by men, and if you're a minority woman, then you're even more oppressed by men. And then the uh, gender minority, you know, the, uh, what is it, the sexual minorities, the homosexuals, LGBTQ, they're oppressed by the heterosexuals, and... Um, then actual racism, white people, you know, they're the ones that oppress, and then those who are the majority in the nation are the oppressors, and it's really, it's eisegesis. It's uh, instead of exegesis, where you actually take the text and seek to explain it and interpret it, eisegesis, where, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about this, where he, he, in his book on the Psalms, he talks about, reading the word we most of us read the word and we see our own faces smiling back at us and that's what this book is Preston Sprinkle has produced a study Bible that he can see his own face smiling back at him rather than God smiling back because we're actually accurately handling his word rightly dividing the word of truth yeah and I I believe I mentioned this in my initial impression of, of this Bible but uh, it is not a study Bible. And that's not an insult of the, the, the content. That is just, it's not a study Bible. The notes are not really going over the scripture. You can go pages and pages and pages without a single note on it. Mm-hmm. It really is picking and choosing the things that they wanted to comment on for their own purposes. Mm-hmm. It's shameful that it was even marketed and sold in the manner it was. Um, a lot of the just um, general layout of it is incredibly poor as well. Um, it, it's kind of embarrassing that it was put out in the state that it was. But I think there was some intent with that. I think there was... Well, that's a, that's a whole other rabbit hole. But jumping off some of the things you've said, you already are familiar with this note. You ha- take particular... Uh, <laughs> you're particularly frustrated by this note. For good reason. But I think it, it connects very much into some of what you were saying. Sure. But this is talking about... Uh, it's going over Genesis 19 with Lot and his daughters. And if you if you don't know the story immediately, it's where after Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Lot's daughters are lamenting the fact that, oh, now we're going to be these, these pariahs because, uh, because of what's happened. So they take matters in their own hands to get children by getting their father drunk. And I mean, I would, I would call it, it maybe not rape in the truest sense of that word. I want to make sure that that word is, is put to its highest degree of heinousness. Sure. But it is a, they are doing something to their father that ought not to be done and intentionally trying to bring about that result against his explicit desire or will. The, t- the text says that uh, he didn't know when they came in the room, and he didn't know when they left. Like, that's how drunk he was. Yeah. Now, should he have gotten that drunk? No. Okay. But, but he's too stupid and sinful. You know, he gets drunk one night, and I think it's the oldest that does that to him, and then the next night, the youngest does it. Yeah. And, it's, it's sin being compounded on sin. Yeah. But let, let's look at this note, because this illustrates some of what you said. Um, the incident is reminiscent of other biblical stories of incest, rape, drunkenness, and procreation. Previously, Lot had offered up his two daughters to be raped by the men of Sodom. Here, Lot's daughters offer up their father as a means to produce offspring. Now, I, I will say that there is such a symmetry between how Lot treated his daughters and how Lot's daughters are now treating him. Mm-hmm. So I'll give him that. But then it goes on to say, here, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in some ways, their motivation is pure. They were not lusting after their father or wanting to engage in some orgiastic act. 
Had another man been available, they would have married him and raised a family. Okay, let, let me just read a tiny bit more of the note and then it, it, it's already so frustrating, but let's just read a tiny bit more. Um, same family sexual relations could be consensual. The motivation might be pure and they might not harm anyone, but consent and lack of harm aren't the only guidelines for biblical sexual ethic. The Bible's sexual ethic is shaped by a beautiful balance between sameness and difference. Too much of either uh, goes against the design of creation. Please, Jared, take away on this one because I'm so frustrated after reading this. Um, and in particular, I know some people might listen to this and not, they might disagree with parts of that, but they might not get the, the full weight of what is actually being said there. So please break it down a little bit and just, what is going on? Yeah, it's just moral relativism based on a critical theory argument. You have these oppressed women that have a pure motive, supposedly, which it, which what he's saying is is that it's possible to have a pure motive if you want to get your dad drunk and have sex with him. Which, how in the world, on what planet, could that ever be due to a pure motive? Ever. Well, you'd have to have a karmic view of sin, not a biblical view. Yeah. Where there is good and there is evil, and they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. Evil is no longer a perversion or lack of good. It is now a separate, separate concept. Mm -hmm. Because if their motivation is, if their motivation is to do something wicked then that motivation is tainted. Mm -hmm. It is no longer good. Good is only that which is perfect, mm -hmm. that which conforms to God's nature. God is never going to have a motivation to do something like this. Yeah. So it's immediately outside of the good. The motivation is yes. perverted. The way, the way the Bible presents good and evil. So in the New Testament, think of the flesh versus the spirit. Um. So that's what I would want to ask Sprinkle. You know, was this of the flesh or was it of the spirit? Because you cannot have a good object with an evil means and still mm -hmm. have a good object. Because mm -hmm. their goal was not God's glory. Their goal was not obedience to God's commands. Um, if it was, they wouldn't want to rape their father. You know, and so there, there's just... If you eliminate... Um, you know, you can say I've got a good motive, but an evil means to get there. Um, no, no. If you've got an evil means, you've got an evil motive. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to please the Lord. And so what Sprinkle doesn't realize is that procreation, according to scripture, is for a husband and wife, um, you know, who are married under the covenant. And then the sexual relationship ensues and offspring be fruitful and multiply. But this is not what this is. This is outside of the bounds of God's parameters, which makes it inherently evil. It's not just, you know, a, a good thing, wrong means. It's inherently evil from root to fruit. Yeah. What is being, what is done there with Lot and his daughters. And, um, but Sprinkle doesn't understand this. He does not understand. He thinks that you can have, he'll make statements like God created community and he'll argue that same sex. Um, that homosexuals are pursuing something good when they pursue same-sex marriage. And that's not what the Bible teaches. God didn't create community. He created God-designed community. Mm -hmm. So it has to be within the parameters um, that God has argued. Let me, let me give you another example. There's a commentary that I was reading the other day, and the guy was arguing that a terrorist is pursuing something good whenever he seeks to kill people. And it was just the most ridiculous thing, but this was a popular Reformed commentary talking. It was in Matthew 4. He was talking about the temptation of Jesus. And it, it was just, so I emailed the guy, and we went, we've been going back and forth. And he, if I said his name, you'd know it. Everybody would know who this guy is. But, um, but anyways, I'm not going to say his name right now but um because we're, talk, we're talking about Preston Sprinkle. But this has been a common theme in Reformed thought past 20 or 30 years that you can have a good ends with an evil means 
and still be pursuing a good ends. And that is yeah. not what the Bible teaches. The good ends and the means, God created both of them. And if you, yeah. if you say, well, I've got a good motive, but the, my, my, my end, or I've got a good means, but my end goal is evil. No, if your end goal is evil, your means are evil. Well, I've got a, a good ends, but an evil means. No, if you've got an evil means, your end goal is evil. Yeah. Like this whole, they're trying to disconnect so that they can justify evil in their hearts. Oh, they had a good motive. They had a pure motive. They just raped their dad. You know, I just, it's nuts. Well, and I, I like, and this is why I included the second part, uh, you know, same family sexual relations could be consensual. They could be motivated. Uh, the motivation might be pure. They might not harm anyone else. Well, I, I think all three of those statements are false. Right. They can't be. Now, I mean, just because two people consent to sin doesn't mean that that, that is a an actually biblically defined consensual relationship. Right. Because relationship is not arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to a sexual relationship. It's not arbitrary. We do not have the agency to define uh, what is and is not acceptable. We do not get to go, you know, the world's obsession with consent, that makes sex justified. That's not how this works. It's, it's covenant. It's marriage. Mm -hmm. So just because two people agree to something doesn't mean it's somehow not... doesn't mean that consent removes a layer of sin. And he's eisegesis too because no, or uh, yeah, um, Lot didn't consent. Like he's drunk out of his mind. So he's evidently passed out or so, so drunk he can't even... C straight, you know? Yeah, the whole thing is is bizarre to me. But this really is, I mean, is this not a typical example from this Bible? This is just one of many. I mean, it, it's, it, you turn, <laughs> you keep going through it and you're thinking, well, maybe this will get better. <laughs> and it doesn't. It, I mean, they just not. keep saying, it's, it's, these are foolish things. And let me just be clear here. This, this is theological liberalism. These guys can say that they have formed biblical orthodoxy in the confessions. There's no one who wrote those confessions that would say that this is biblically orthodox. No one. There's no one in church history. Most Roman Catholics in church history would say this is ridiculous. Like, th that's the thing. Like, he, he is a theological liberal um, dressing up and pretending to be biblical. Which I, I believe I mentioned to you, you know, talking with... Um Christians on the progressive side of the spectrum, they don't like Preston for the same reasons as well because they don't like that he's dressing up uh, liberal theology in conservative clothes. Mm -hmm. So he, who is he appealing to? Yeah. I, but he does appeal to people. He is popular. It's ridiculous that he's popular. He's, well... I don't know that they're doing it today as well, but just the past two days was his fourth Exiles in Babylon conference. It should just be called the Babylon Conference. I mean, this book, well, that, this Bible study, like when it when I saw it was the upside down Bible, I was like, really? So you're just telling people what your your Bible study is going to be? Well, because it's it's <laughs> turning the the kingdoms of the earth upside down. Yeah, yeah. I know what he tried to do, but it's like it's like God is writing the story. Yeah, there's there's a <laughs> a bit of a a biting humor to it. You, you call your your conference, you've got Babylon in your title. You call your Bible upside down, like God's writing the story. His last name's Sprinkle. I mean, it's just very very fascinating how the Lord is writing the story. Uh, yeah, and it's it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate because we're not here to say, oh, these are bad things and haha, we want to make fun of them. Yeah. What's our end goal? I mean, I believe we're on the same page with what's our end goal? Yeah, we want to protect the church from wolves and Preston's a wolf. And there's no way, there's no way to argue otherwise. He pre presents a study Bible. And what what's so sinister about this is that 
there are conservatives, at least people who are at biblically conservative schools. There's a professor at Southeastern Theological Seminary that's a contributor mm -hmm. to the first uh, five books in there on women, and it's straight feminism. I mean, it, it's just straight. It's contrary to what Southern Baptists believe. It's contrary to our confession. It's contrary to what Southeastern says that they believe. Yep. And she's an assistant director over there of the PhD program. Yep. And so, I mean, I'll, I'm going to respond to her publicly and I just try to find her other writings and read them and see if she's being faithful to Scripture because it, it's frustrating. Like, why are, why are we flirting? It seems that everybody's always flirting with theological liberalism. Like, I, if I was Danny Aiken, I wouldn't permit Christine Thornton to write for that. Yeah. It'd be like you can't write for a wolf's Bible study. Yeah, and it's something that's very frustrating to me. Now, I want to very minorly switching gears. We'll still talk about this Bible, but I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see this as well? Do you see a problem with because people on on the this dressed up, this theological liberalism dressed up as in conservative clothing. So the not openly progressive, but uh, exactly who we're talking about, Preston and others. They like to mock, and I, I would call it mocking, but they like to mock uh, true conservatives for not asking difficult questions. Do you see this uh, like I do? Now, what I see is them saying... Not you're not asking tough questions, but you're not coming to our conclusions. Therefore, you're not asking tough questions. Because I know, at least for me, uh, in some of the the ministry work I do, I encourage tough questions. We dive into the difficult. I mean, what is this podcast doing? What does your book do? We're diving into these same subjects. So, do you see that as well? A, a disconnect, a, a kind of a manipulation tactic to make people like us look bad for not asking tough questions. It's just empty rhetoric. I mean, that's what fuels the entire movement. That's what fuels Preston Sprinkle. It's all empty turn of phrase. Mm -hmm. um, he, As long as he's talking about us not asking difficult questions, what does that even mean, not asking difficult questions? Oh, he's willing to, to question what Christians have believed for, you know, ever since the garden. Um, you know, what Israelites have believed, what Christians have believed. I mean, it's infuriating because mm. he's a theological liberal. He's in a bubble. You're never going to see him debate somebody on these issues because he, he couldn't. He can't debate anyone on these issues. Um, well, I did a, an entire uh, episode of the podcast was looking at your interaction with Preston on his podcast and... Oh, holy moly, I, that was just, I mean, it was insulting for one, the, the way that he was behaving. Yeah. And there was no, there was no debate. There was no even discussion. He was just there. His only tactic was, you're wrong. Now apologize for being wrong. I mean, it, that is everything that he claims that we do to people. Yeah. It, it, it's hypocritical. Yeah. It, it's frustratingly hypocritical. Now, you know, I mentioned this before in the whole uh, Who is the Real Preston series. I've been emailing Preston every single episode, giving him the episode, the podcast episode, the article, giving him all the information, asking questions, putting it in his court. Still have that open offer. I will drive down to Boise. I will meet with him in person. Private conversation private conversation doesn't even need to be recorded i'm going to go out of my way but those emails go unanswered uh, i try and reach out to him i'm trying to do everything that he he claims he wants he won't ever debate with any of us until it costs him money you know what i'm saying if he starts getting a dent in his pocketbook then he'll publicly respond but so Rosaria is saying what she said publicly against him um, hurt his pocketbook, I assume. And so he well, it definitely put a, a dent in his credibility. Yeah, and he he wanted to publicly respond to that, and he couldn't get to her, so he had me on. 
and he told me we were going to have a conversation. Would you come on and have a conversation? And uh, it wasn't a conversation; it was a interrogation. And um, so I think even interrogation is a little bit generous because that generally involves question and answer. Yeah, there, there was no intent for you to respond. No, he kept saying, um, "Let's come back to that." When I would ask him a question, and and he never came back to it. No. He actually he actually told me he would not ever, he would. Um, he wouldn't have ever have me speak at one of his events. I said, mm-hmm. let's, let's debate publicly. And he said, no, I'll never have you speak it. So he's having like, you know, he had a guy, a guy who was a, I say a guy, he says that he, his pronouns are they. He had, he let him speak at one of his things and he won't let me. I said, you know, you, you wouldn't let someone with a Confederate flag in their bio on Twitter speak. But you'll let someone with pronouns in their bio speak. Like there's just, he is literally taking the liberal playbook and um, saying, I'm confessional, I'm biblical. And then everything that comes out of his mouth is against literally what Christianity has taught for 2,000 years. Um, this, this study Bible is exactly that. It's just a declaration against what Christians have believed. Yeah, that's something that really caught me off guard. My my expectations were similar to you. Now, I had seen some information about it, so I had a broader understanding of the topics. Mm-hmm. So I was expecting other topics to be covered just as poorly. I was not expecting this to essentially be a manifesto. Mm-hmm. The notes really are laying out, this is what we want Christianity to become. Yes. Which is very... It, it, it was surprising. There's a degree of honesty, a degree of honesty that you don't usually see from Preston in particular. He does not like to be nailed down to a specific um, ideology, a specific doctrine, a specific uh, stance on a, on a subject. But this does kind of, it forced his hand to a certain degree. Now, there are so many notes. Have you, have you come across any of these notes that come out to, you know, long note might be the entire length of a page across the, the margin and it comes out to saying, this is too complicated. We just don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. Oh, you haven't? Oh, well, I'll show you a couple of those after after the recording. But yeah, there are multiple times. It boils down to, this is so complicated, we just can't know. Now, this is another aspect of this Bible that I think is important. What is the problem with, with approaching a biblical passage? Now, there might be tiny little things that we don't understand every detail on, but to go over a multiverse passage and say, this is too complicated, we don't know, how detrimental is that to, well, I mean, essentially everything, but how detrimental is that to the Word? It's very detrimental because you punt. Our job is to read the Word, understand it, believe it, understand it. And so we have a responsibility to understand it. God gave it to us so that we would understand it. It's his self-revelation. So we'd rightly understand him and his creation and us. And so we have a responsibility to understand it. And you need to, I mean, you, you throw your hands up and say, well, it's too complicated. You need to be saying, well, this argument is the most probable. Like, it, you know, you, you interpret it, you rightly handle it, and what you end up with, that's what you believe. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we need to encourage, actual exegesis, instead of, oh, this is a difficult passage. Even, there, it drives me, it, it aggravates me, because they'll say, no, this isn't liberalism. But it's basically what progressivism teaches, and taking that and subtly putting it in there, in their commentary. Mm-hmm. I mean, in their view of women, like they argue that the whole, everything I've read about women in there argues that women are oppressed. Yeah. And um, we've got literally a, a woman vice president right now, and she may be president. Um, you know, Mexico just had a, 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 has a woman president right now. I mean, literally in American history, women are less oppressed than they've ever been. <laughs> in I mean, in human history. and uh, But anyways, so th- this argument, it, it's basically taking the progressive agenda and saying, okay, 
let's find passages. So they drew conclusions, and yeah. then let's find passages that fit what we want to say. You know, that's that's what you were pointing to earlier, and yep. that's exactly what this is. And uh, it really is not worth. I hated that I had to buy it. Just honestly, <laughs> I hated that. Man, he's gonna get money for this because you know the the way these things work. The editor continues to get money as long as it's sold. Everybody mm-hmm. else got a lump sum. You know, everybody else contributors they get. Like, I will give you five hundred dollars to write these articles, and that's what they get. And then, but the editor he'll get every book they sell. He'll get money. Yeah, the editing game is it's kind of dirty. I don't like <laughs> yeah. how a lot of that works. It's it's an author by a different name. Yeah, yeah. It gives you a degree of, of deniability, but then you reap all the benefits as if you had written the content. Yeah, well, I, and the publishers make all the money too, you know. Oh, yeah. That's another big problem, <sighs> which is a little bit off topic. But <laughs> I want to switch gears a tiny degree because I think we need to bring in some of the hopefulness. Now, in your, your talk yesterday, you were talking about, uh, you were talking somewhat about pornography, and you went on a, it was a sort of a tangent, you know, sort of a sanctified rabbit trail, if we could call it that. <laughs> uh, but you brought in the idea of the need for in person, mm-hmm. the need for in person human interaction, and how much uh, different that is compared to screens, compared to pixels on screens, things like that. And then you brought it to the church a little bit and the need for in-person interaction when it comes to the church, Mm -hmm. whether that's the actual church service or uh, just other things. Now, this could be a dangerous thing to say on a podcast, but personally, I think we have a bit of a pandemic of podcasts right now. Mm -hmm. There are far too many they're competing for your attention, and they're competing for your attention in the realm of and above the physical interactions. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you might be able to make a few comments on uh, comments on that, and bring it back to uh, some of the subjects we've already been talking about, because I think there's some applications of how we inoculate ourselves against some of these false ideas connected to the need for in-person interaction and specifically mm-hmm. within the church. Yeah, so, you know, from Genesis 2, Adam and Eve were made for face-to-face contact. That is ideal. And so um, the rest of Scripture, you know, that's God's ideal. So the further you get away from that, the more detrimental it is to humanity to societies you know they they talk about even in the prison system people who are locked up in solitary confinement for a long length of time yeah go psycho yeah they just go crazy and um they there's been studies to argue that they're when they get out of prison that they're more prone to take their own lives and things like that um you see it with in the healthcare system those who don't have any visitors yeah. don't live as long as those who do and have interaction well, I'm sure you've run into the situation where an uh, older person's spouse dies and they're, you know, they're still living at home, so they're now by themselves, and two, three months later, despite being healthy, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're, yeah. we're made for face-to-face contact, so the further you get from that, the more detrimental it is. Now, it's one thing if you can't have face-to-face contact, you know, like somebody in the military, I uh, got to call home or... Yeah. Things like that. But ideally, face-to-face contact is how God has designed us. And you can't kick against God's design. Mm -hmm. And it goes the same for the church. If you notice the Apostle Paul, who had the gift of singleness, um, meaning he didn't need marriage and did not have that sexual desire for consummation, um, you'll see that he's constantly asking for folks to come see him. Or, I need so-and-so. Send them to me. Or yeah. so-and-so has been with me, they greet you. And there's all this emphasis of him needing um, face-to-face contact with other Christians, even as yeah. he's writing these letters. And, and so we see it with Paul. I mean, you, could, you could argue even with Jesus. He goes and spends time in prayer for a time, but then he comes back and he spends time with his disciples. Yep. 
Um, so there's this, you know, he, he wasn't a loner, you know. Um, and, you know, I had a, a guy tell me one time that he wanted to be alone his whole life. And, you know, he had had a divorce and had gotten into it with his kids, his adult kids. And so he's basically by himself. And he said, you know, Jared, I've wanted to be alone my whole life. And now that I'm alone, it's killing me. That's what he said. And so I suggested seeking reconciliation with his family, but also being active in the local church. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I say all that to say that instead of doing what we want, we have to submit ourselves to the Word of God. So if ideally face-to-face contact is God's design for us, you can't kick against that design. And so you have people, I, it, I think all this stuff about I'm an extrovert, I'm an introvert, you know, all that, those arguments, I think that's baloney. I think you're yeah. giving labels to, you know, your personality so that you can justify why you don't want to be around people. Yeah. I mean, personally, I'm terrible at small talk. Mm-hmm. So starting a conversation is incredibly difficult for me. Mm-hmm. And it's, it was, when I was younger, it was easy to say, well, that's just because I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. But that was a justification for isolation. Yes. And in fact, that was a justification to then declare myself a victim. Yes. And it really was a problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, as a teenager, uh, before I was saved, and even after I was saved, because I was just not growing and maturing, because I wasn't pursuing the right things, I put myself in a horrible position. Mm-hmm. I was legitimately depressed. My, uh, just my mind was out of whack. Mm -hmm. One of the big reasons was isolation. Mm -hmm. Now, I had friends, but I convinced myself that a a certain type of isolation was what I was made for. Yep. And it's not a surprise that my brain was frustrated and rebelling against that and causing tension in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, folks today, man, on social media, we've got we've got more contact, virtual contact with people than we've ever had. Like I have more friends, friends than I've ever had in my entire life. But it's the face to face contact is ideal. Like that is what you need. Yeah. yeah. And so the suicide rate is astronomical among teenagers. We have more therapy than we've ever had. We have l- less meaningful revel less meaningful relationships mm-hmm. than we've ever had. That's the issue. That's I think if you fix the relationships, you'll see the suicide rate plummet. Oh, yeah. um, but it's so high now because none of these teens have true friends, and they make all these excuses. Oh, I'm uncomfortable. And then the parents are like, oh, my baby, you're uncomfortable. Well, you don't have to do this. And blah, blah, blah. You know, and all you're doing is, is tying a, a millstone around that kid's neck yeah. And that maybe, maybe they'll be like Kyle and when they're in their 20s or 30s be able to come out of it. But a lot of them don't and never do. And they end up, you know, if they end up married, they don't even know how to talk. I mean, most of these no. teens, they only know how to talk to the opposite sex. They don't well, even know how to talk to anybody. The divorce rate among people from my, my old youth group, astronomically high. Mm. Astronomically high. I also I went to a Christian school as well. The amount of people that have just completely checked out on life, are divorced, or uh, have have walked away from the faith is crazy. The majority of my friends who professed to be Christians, we're not talking about the ones that were honest with themselves. We're talking about the ones that professed to be Christians, are in those states, and it, it it's just. You know, I'm in my 30s, so they're talking about people in their 30s are in that place. They're mm-hmm. not finding themselves out, figuring out where, who they are. what. The, no, they're past that point of life, way past that point of life, mm-hmm. and it never happened. So the excuses that people make for themselves are just crippling. And so let's try and bring this back around to things like the Upside Down Bible. What does this need for in-person have to do with false teachings? Yeah, the qualifications of a pastor, like these faceless people who contributed to this book, you don't know if they're qualified to even talk on these subjects. Like what, they got PhD in their names? 
there's a whole lot of atheists that got PhDs. Like, there's a whole lot of evil people that got those degrees. So how do you even know that these people are qualified to speak on these subjects? Not only that, but are they even qualified, pastorally qualified, to even be teaching Scripture Mm-hmm. to their hearers and you don't know that but there's this celebrity mentality today everybody's got their favorite preachers I mean they're John MacArthur David Jeremiah you know and there's nothing wrong with listening to those guys what's wrong is whenever you'd rather listen to them than your local pastor who you know that he is qualified to teach scripture yes you don't know if, I mean Steve Lawson's a perfect example of this you don't know if these pastors are qualified you assume they are because they're pastoring churches but you don't know them. They don't know your name. You don't know them. I mean, it's good to listen to them, but your primary diet, besides your own reading of the Word, should be your local church pastor and the Sunday school teacher or discipleship leader, like people that you know. Mm-hmm. Because God particularly associates the qualifications for preaching the Word with particular qualifications. And if you don't know if they've got those qualifications, you've been bitten by the fame bug. Yep. Like you think that, oh, David Jeremiah said it, it must be true. Well, you don't even know. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm hesitant to question some of those big name guys like MacArthur too. But um, we need a steady diet of face to face individuals, and even the qualifications yeah. for pastor lend itself to knowing them face to face. Yeah. Like. So that's what we need to encourage, and the primary diet, our primary diets, should be local church pastors that we know. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there is a fame bug, though. I do. I, you know, and uh, you know, MacArthur, for example. You know, Travis preached the other day, and um, these these famous guys have research teams. You know, they've got research teams that can. Okay, these are the best commentaries on these arguments, and they put it, and then they hand it to you. And then you prepare your sermon in light of, well, I don't have to run down all these, you know, some of the work's already done for me as far as sources. And uh, Moeller does this with his... Uh, uh, his uh, the briefing. The briefing. I mean, Moeller isn't out there getting all this stuff by himself. Yeah, if you put the math together on some of these, the output of these people, it doesn't math out. There is a pretty significant degree of, of assistance and help. They have research people who go and get the best sources and then hand it to them. Now, these guys, like Muller's a brain, he can read every bit of that and then boom, he's got an episode. Like he's able to, he's a systematic theologian, so he can do all that. MacArthur, same way, they can, they can do that. But... To compare yourself, so if you're at your church, if you're being compared to these guys, well, give me a research team, <laughs> right? Like, give me, <laughs> give me a research team. You want a research team? Is that going to be in the budget yeah. for next year? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me a research team, and you want me to preach like MacArthur? Give me a re- well. I probably still couldn't do it, but you know what I mean. Like, there's this, um, and they don't even know MacArthur. He wouldn't know their name, like. I know their name. You know their name. Like, you, you, you need to know who's preaching to you so you know whether or not he's living the life. Because mm-hmm. evidently, you know, there are men out there who are proclaiming one thing and living another. Yeah. And it really gives a black eye to people's faith in the church. And, and uh, so anyway, if you'll face-to-face contact, pursue other believers. And what, what God intended was face-to-face contact based on the garden yeah and based on most of human history and so we need to be spending more time together one of the things we did at our church was we started doing a breakfast once a month or before sunday school just trying to get folks to spend time together more yeah because you'll grow and and i mean it, that's what we need even yeah. if we think we don't need it don't want it you know we need that yeah and so i, I think so if i could summarize we are we've got to quit talking about what i feel what i want i'm an introvert i'm an extrovert oh this is how i'm designed blah 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 no you're not right god has designed you for human interaction yeah for other people and part of getting out of your depression if you're depressed part of that part of the remedy of that is face-to-face contact and if you're a christian the local church is the best place to do that 
Oh, yeah. If you're not a Christian, the local church is still the best place to do that. So get saved and go and spend time with other believers and sit under that preaching and believe what God's Word says and live it. Yeah. And when you're in that, that system, that system of community, that system of worship and discipleship and fellowship, what's gonna, the end result is you're going to grow. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to or not, if you are invested in those things, you will be growing. Mm -hmm. And what does that growth bring? That growth is not, you know, you're not a, a vine shooting off in a random direction. You're a tree. You're going to go straight up. Mm -hmm. When you are growing, you're going to be growing towards the Lord. You're going to be growing. You're going to be sanctified, mm -hmm. made and conformed to the image of Christ. When that process is occurring, you're going to look at false teachings and they're going to start to become more and more evident. The lack of, you know, putting this in the context we're talking about, the lack of care for you will become evident. Mm -hmm. The care for oneself will start to become clear. I mean, there's more notes. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're done for the... the Upside down Bible, but there are yeah, more yeah. notes in there that really display that the uh, the authors care for themselves first, and trying to understand they're trying to understand themselves, their sin, and present that to you as something justifiable. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that that community, when you are investing in that face to face, when you are growing, how you should be growing. You'll look at those self-serving things and you'll go, I mean, you might not even know exactly what's wrong. And this is something, you don't need to be a theologian. Mm -hmm. Not every single one of you out there is going to be, you know, this, this deep theologian. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I brought up my grandma multiple times. Her faith is more unshakable than mine because I am more complicated. Mm -hmm. Because I want to know the, the, I want to know more information. I want to dive deeper. For her, no, mm -hmm. it is so simple. You couldn't bring any of this nonsense to her. She would look at it and just toss it aside and go pick up a Bible. Yep, that's Didn't... exactly right. So you don't need. You will be able to sniff it out naturally when you are growing in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't understand everything wrong with it, you'll be able to go, "Oh, that's kind of weird." I think I'm just going to go. You know, what does my pastor think of this? What does the Word think of this? I'm just going to go read this instead. You don't need, you'll lose that need for other things. Mm -hmm. So any other final words as we kind of wrap this up? Uh, just briefly, the uh, something you said. So there's a real popular uh, Bible study that's been popular for like 30 years, I think. The love languages, you heard this? Mm -hmm. The love languages? Yeah. Like my love language is... Uh, was it gifts or like I like getting gifts that's how I know that I'm feel that I'm loved like so stuff like that I don't like either because of it puts the onus on the other person like my wife should know how I want to be loved and she has a responsibility to meet my needs and love me the way that I'm designed to be loved when the Bible doesn't even emphasize any of that, the Bible says, husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. Like, the onus is on the other person. The onus is on me to love my wife. Mm -hmm. When I stand before God one day, He's not going to say, Jared, did your wife love you? He's going to say, did you love your wife? Yeah. So, books like that, and it's good for me to know what my wife likes, but you know how you know that? Honey, what do you like? <laughs> you know, I don't have to read stinking love languages to figure that out. You build a relationship. I mean, this is uh, Pastor Dan this morning. We were going over Genesis um, and just finished. Got out of the got out of the garden and talking about uh, Adam knew his wife. So, and he was railing in some of the bad translations of that because that wasn't simply just. He had sex with his wife. Mm -hmm. The word there is so much deeper than that. Mm. It is a richer knowing of someone. And yes, in that context, it was the 
the final culmination of knowing in a marriage relationship, the physical knowing, mm -hmm. but it's more than just physical act, boom, the, then a baby's produced. No, there, there's something much deeper. This, this level of knowing someone, mm -hmm. understanding them. And, this is, you know, if we as men are to love our wives as Christ loves the church, how much does God know us? Mm -hmm. Is there anything about us that he does not understand? Any, any crevice of our life that he does not see? Mm. He knows us fully. Mm -hmm. So th this, this, we really do need to know one, each other, one another. We need to understand, have a true understanding. And here's the thing with that. If you truly understand someone, how easy is it to, to communicate with them, to share that relationship with them, to prove your love? Mm -hmm. How easy is it? Well, I mean, it's the same way with the church. Like, people say, and I hate it with visitors, they're like, I went to that church and nobody said hi to me, and so I never went back. And I'm just like, did you say hi to anybody? <laughs> you know, did you did you talk to anybody? Did you like it, it's such a weird now churches should be friendly. Yeah. I'm not saying that, but these people they who a Christian goes and visits a church, they think that it's the, the church is wrong if they don't talk to them. But if they, the visitor, doesn't talk to the people, they think that's perfectly fine. Like, it's their responsibility. Well, why? You're a believer. What are you talking about? You have a responsibility. There, you're one in Christ with these people. So I, I just, there's so much selfishness. Um, there's so much lack of love, and it's mm -hmm. all based on excuses. We expect everybody to love us and don't expect our, us to love really anybody else except our spouses and our children. And we have responsibility to love the local church. And so um, we really... What will help folks is if you stop talking about yourself. <laughs> Just stop talking about yourself. Talk much about God. Talk much about your neighbor. Your third. You know, and if and if everybody in the church did that, good grief, yeah, things would be so amazing. Like I'm talking mm -hmm. pastors. Pastors, quit talking about yourselves. Um, you know, all leaders in the church, all members we quit talking about ourselves and start exalting god and others what and are the, the what are the, the the number one and number two commandments yeah love god love your neighbor yeah uh, that's the prioritization yeah. you become you're not in one and two right well i mean you are in the sense that you're supposed to be doing this you're supposed to be loving god you're supposed to be loving neighbor mm -hmm. your prioritization is in the fact that you are the doer. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you got to get this in the right order and the right action in mm -hmm. that order. But I think I think this has been a really good conversation. We do probably need to come to a close. Sure, bro. But uh, is there any final word that you would like uh, for people to hear as we can, we uh, wrap this up? Um, I've got a an article coming out, uh, Master Seminary Journal. With, uh, on Jesus' temptations, so it'll be kind mm. of an academic approach to Jesus' temptations. That'll that'll be out around Christmas, and then I'm writing another book on repentance um, that should be out next year, and so I hope that's uh, beneficial to folks. And um, if any of y'all have any questions, you can find me on Twitter at Jared H Moore, or um, you know, if you want to, I mean, that's probably the best way to contact me. And just just ask questions, and I'll do my best to answer any questions. Or yeah, you know, if you have hate mail or something, you can send it to Kyle. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> send it my way. I'll, I'll file that away. Uh, now, I really appreciate uh, the pastoral attitude that you've had and how you approach things. Uh, your talks yesterday, this conversation, very pastoral, very caring for people, very putting the emphasis where it needs to be. Thank you, bro. And that's that's. You know, if you're going to go out for an external resource, you need to find people that are showing that they're actually caring, that they're actually trying to, to build you up rather than giving you a overpriced book that's half fluff. 
Um, and even then, I mean, this is one of those silly things, but I think it's actually like a useful thing. Whatever book you're reading, put it underneath your Bible. <laughs> I think that those, those little, little things like doing that can just prevent you from getting your priorities off. Yeah. Okay, I was going to pick up that book, but you know what? I have not read my Bible today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that that's the priority. So, do you have any problem with someone putting your book underneath their Bible? No, put it under there. Okay. Please. Good. Same thing with this <laughs> podcast. Honestly, if this, if you ever turn this on before you go to another Christian, before you go to your pastor, before you've read your Bible, whatever it is, turn it off. I don't care. I don't need you to listen. But... Jared, it was wonderful to have yeah. this opportunity to do it in person. Yeah. Conversation. Enjoyed it. Uh, I really appreciated your talks yesterday. I really appreciated this conversation. So uh, I think there's a lot of good value here. Um, with that, remember you can go to EWTCnews.com to view the documentary if you haven't already. Stay up to date on the latest that's going on with Enemies Within the Church. Uh, we're going to try and get some more articles going up there. Uh, now that we've done a little refresh of the website. Uh, but I hope this has been encouraging. If it has, consider sharing it with someone. And when I say that, I've made this, this clarification before. Share it with someone who you think would actually benefit, not just blast it on your social media. That's fine if you want to do something like that. But if it's a resource, not entertainment. Resources are for those who need that resource. Uh, and remember... Don't go woke. <laughs>